You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. Exodus 35, verses 10 through 19 in the Christian Standard Bible. Let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tents and covering, its clasp and supports, its crossbars, its pillars and bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain for the screen, the table with its poles, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for light with its utensils, and lamps as well as the oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the entryway screen for the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze gate, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its post and bases, and its screen for the gate of the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and the tent pegs for the courtyard, along with their ropes, and specially woven garments for the ministers in the sanctuary, the holy garments for the priest Aaron and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. Here, Moses is having the children of Israel prepare the tabernacle in the exact way that God commanded them to do it. We see everyone's kind of working together, arts and crafts, tailoring robes, we're decorating the worship area, we're putting stuff out that symbolizes greater things. Even though we're no longer under the law of Moses as Christians, but we still believe that the arts play an important part of worship. Taylor Clyde, why do you believe God had the people of Israel put so much into the decor of worship and what can the church today learn from that yeah i think that like everything else that we do in the church world at least from my perspective is the whole goal is to point people to jesus and so from my desk you know in my mindset through everything that i do every graphic that we create every video that we edit and produce every environment that we create it is to ultimately take people's eyes from the stage and to to put them on Jesus. And so that's that's what I see in this passage. Hmm, man, sounds relevant for today's topic too. Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite church unity podcast. I'm Joshua Knoll, and we are continuing our ecumenical aesthetic series where we are discussing with people the importance of arts, in the church and the variety of different ways that people use art or don't use the art or avoid icons or use icons in their worship, you know, all the good things. We're back with the first guest of the series. Uh, Taylor Clyde is back again. He's going to be talking with us some about online media and the art in that way and how church is using like graphic design kind of stuff. Uh, we will also be joined by uh, a favorite returning guest of the show, Joe Day. And, you know, he's done plenty of podcasts and he now also works in online media with his church. So we're excited to discuss that with both of them, how we use art online for the church. So um, I'm here alone. TJ will not be joining us this time, the world's greatest ho-host. So welcome, Taylor. Welcome, Joe. He came in right as I said that. So if you're just listening, you have no idea how incredible that was. Uh, but he can't hear me. We'll figure it out soon. <laughs> But that being said, um, go ahead and check out the Amazon Ministries Podcast Network, the AMP Network. The link is down below. You'll see other shows like ours and Taylor's other show, The Clydes. Uh, they got some good like half journal, half discipleship, half uh, weekly devotional, I guess. Three halves of one show. Does that make sense? Three halves make a whole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Of course, also, you could get some of our merch on our at the store, also in the show notes. Get a comfy shirt, represent ecumenical work. It's important, you know. And with that, we'll jump to uh, my favorite form of unity, a uh, spiritual practice I like to participate in, which is um, silliness, you know. <laughs> Naturally, I, I'm a very silly guy, so we will ask a silly question. I'll answer it first to give you guys time to think about it. Which Old Testament prophet do you think would make for the best podcaster? Um, man, I, I feel like I come up with these like wild, crazy questions and I surprise myself with them because I forget so easily that I put it there. Man, <laughs> how am I going to, you know, uh, this might be a hard sell, 
This might be a hard sell. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait, you know what? I changed my mind. I was <laughs> I was going to say Jeremiah and try to make a case for Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. But I, does, does Ezra count as a prophet? I want to say yes. It's got a name that hangs with the other prophets, you know? Yeah, I feel like he counts. That's right. I feel like Ezra would be a really solid podcaster. Because <laughs> if you remember in the book of Nehemiah, it talks about how when Ezra said the words of the word of the scripture that people had heard what they had never heard before. So mm-hmm. I feel like he's got a, a really good way of pr- presenting, you know, like he's got to be a good presenter. It's yeah. true. Yeah, it's true. I think right, for Taylor. me, I would have to say it's going to be Jonah, I would say, because Ooh. I think you would have the guilt factor. I think you would feel bad about I think you would have equal parts, right? Of feeling like, man, this guy got swallowed up and live to tell about it. He's the Joe Rogan of Christian podcasts. I have to listen to him. But he'd also have that, he, you'd have that guilt factor. Like, man, the Lord caused this stuff to happen to you. Like, I guess I should give you some of my time on my morning commute, you know? Man, that's funny too, because I'm just imagining him podcasting under the shade of that tree and it getting cut down while he's like mid, mid broadcast. Like, <laughs> sorry guys, just we just cut out there. about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. So one of the main reasons we're doing this series is because of our belief that beauty can bring people closer to God and to one another. Um, so with that, we have a few questions we're asking everybody in this series. I mentioned it off air. Taylor's already done some of these questions. So we're going to throw a few questions just to Joe before we get to the meat of today's episode. Um, starting off, Joe, could you tell us of a time that you've seen um, God in the beauty of creation, just like the outdoors or I guess man may creation could count too. just, you know, outdoor stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one time in particular that, that comes to mind is, um, I was in, it was when I lived in, um, Duluth, Minnesota and, um, I was up in, so for those of you that don't know, Duluth is really big for um, shipping, and there's there's a lot of um, water up there and all of that. It was not long after I got saved, and I'm up there, and we're getting ready to start for the day, and I remember just watching the sunrise and just it really clicking in my mind as I'm watching the sunrise and understanding um, – the science behind the sunrise and and what happens and and all the just the the mechanical nature of the beauty and mm-hmm. being able to see the fact that not only is this gorgeous with the illuminating sky and the colors and all of that kind of stuff but also to understand and see the hand of the creator in the midst of all of that um, was was really a pivotal moment for me in being able to conceptualize like, hey, I've got this relationship. I've got this new and, and budding aspect of my life and these things that I would have otherwise appreciated in in beauty and art and, and all of those kinds of things. There is now this additional layer to it to be appreciated. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yes. <laughs> I was going to share something there with, we already, TJ and I already got to share on these questions. So I feel like <laughs> you're like, I have a great thought. I can't double. I feel like I've said this before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Joe, another one is, um, we were wondering if you could share a moment with us, if you have one that you've spelled a special connecting to a painting or sculpture or anything like that. Um, and it doesn't have to be religious. Just if you've ever had something like that. Yeah. So, um, when I was in, when I was in Rome, um, it wasn't even one of, so usually you hear the, the big temple items of Italy when you hear somebody talk about that. But one of the things that got me was over there, their churches are by and large open that you can just kind of come and go as, as you please in a lot of churches and some of the um the artwork there that they would just consider just an average church is just so incredibly breathtaking and one of the spots that i remember stopping was a catholic church 
that had a an accurate rendition of Jesus. I, I say that in with the, with all of the asterisks of you know it, you, a, accurate to what we know Jesus would have looked like versus an Americanized Jesus um, among the people that just captured his connection with people in caring for people that I've never seen before hmm. in, in art. Yeah. Hmm. Man. Yeah. My, um, my parents actually got to go do some like different Europe tours and my dad said something very similar. So it's, um, maybe one day I'll get, to, I'll get to see what you're all talking about. <laughs> oh man. No, it sounds incredible though. So the last one before we have uh we have a special segment we're going to do, but there's a lot of studies that show there's a healing aspect, like physically healing, something about perceiving beauty, whether it's by sound or sight or whatever. Um, I was curious, Joe, do you think there's a reason why God wired us this way where our bodies can actually heal by perceiving beauty? Yeah, I, I think there's a masterful aspect to the fact that the human body was designed with a with a vibrational pattern that resonates and is affected by the vibrational patterns that we can come that we can um, come in contact with here on Earth. So if it's music, um, if it's there's there's um, studies that show that nature sounds have a healing component to them. Um, there's mm -hmm. effects that can happen on the human body when exposed to something that the human finds beautiful that um, change aspects of the vibrational patterns of humans. So yeah, I, I think that that is, you know, without, without going into um, theological theory, I think at the very bare minimum, we can call that a gift from God. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, um, I don't know how much truth there is in this, but I've heard someone talk about how a lot of times people die shortly after their partner does. And they were talking about how it's really that to you, that's the most beautiful person there is. And you just spend so much time around them that it's almost like the lack of beauty leaves something missing. And that actually has like the opposite effect. I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but it's an interesting thought. Yep. So I'll just put a, you know, dot, dot, dot. Look up later. Everybody Google that. <laughs> oh, man. So the uh, the segment I was talking about, we have on this show, this series, we've been doing um, what's called the Artist Corner, where you have a few questions. We're going to take seven minutes. So if you want to spend all seven on one question, cool. If you just want to say skip until you find a question you like, that works too. <laughs> Um, and for this one, since Taylor's done it before, if we get to a question you haven't done or that you thought of something and you want to add, just kind of like raise your hand and I'll, I'll let you, you do it too. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, here we go. Um, I'm supposed to do this in a random order. Let's see. Joe, what kind of wall decor is around your church and what is the significance of it? So, <laughs> um, the church that, uh, so, so this is a two part question. One is the house church. The house church has, um, stuff that is very specifically not Christian, but for a reason, like geek culture stuff, or like we've got, um, Halloween decorations up right now, things like that, because the idea is very intentionally bringing the beauty of Christ into everyday things. So it's very purposefully um, avoiding stuff, uh, stuff like that right now. Um, in the church that I'm currently doing my, my residency with, um, there has been, so we just moved into a new building and there is a big screen up now but uh, that's covering a, a Spanish eyesore that, and I say that because a Spanish artist was flown in by the Catholic church to create this ridiculous monstrosity that has <laughs> the what? God, the father. Oh dude, God, the father in a Pope's hat, not even kidding. Um, 
Huh. One of one of the most intimidating doves I've ever seen in my entire life. That looks like a scene out of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Uh, huh. we, we've got the Mother Mary, who is larger than life. Um, and Jesus looking quite possibly the most judgmental that I've ever seen. Mm. Um, and in the upper right hand corner is a moon that you can't tell me is not just a Death Star. It's just the Death Star in there, uh, just for good measure. Um <laughs> Okay, but, but so so I mentioned that because also is um, a piece of artwork that was created by the same artists that are Stations of the Cross, mm -hmm. and the way that they were that they were created um, really is breathtaking because it puts you in the moment. It puts you. It, it there is a uh, surrealist um, aspect to the way that this was created that was um, that that really does force you to be presented with that aspect of what it's representing. Hmm. Man. Yeah, man, I'm glad we <laughs> we did that question. Um, also, for context, those listening, Joe has been ordained within the last year. He still has a house church, but also now is ministering, doing some online media stuff and other things for a, a local church. I, I, I say local. I don't know how local it is to him, but I know it's not local to me. So in my mind, it just is local to him. <laughs> Um, okay, so Joe, uh, let's do an easier one. Do you prefer hymns or modern worship music? Yes. So I prefer hymns in yeah. a slightly different style, like a, I guess, modernized style um, mm -hmm. that I think, I think when it comes to hymns or it comes to singing the Psalms or something along those lines, um, that that's that's a that's a sweet spot for me when it comes to the content of the worship. Um, I do think that are, that there are good wor God good modern worship songs. I'm not one of those types that's like let's just throw out all of modern music and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I am picky when it comes to the content of what the actual song is. Mm. Joe, have you heard of a band called Ascend the Hill? I have not. Oh my goodness. I really feel like they're not, I don't think they're around anymore, but I feel like you would really like them. They do, they have a great album they put out. I think it was in 2010 or something like that, but it's hymns, but it's very, it's very different style. I don't know. Yeah. It's heavier, but not real. It's like maybe post post rock. I don't know. It's really cool though. Ascend the hill. Good stuff. I feel like this is too mainstream to be cool, but I still really like Jimmy Needham's hymn volume. Thought that was nice. Yeah, me need him. God, I, no. I like his voice a lot. Um, okay, let's see. Last one, probably. Depends on how quick it is. I just assume this will be it. Joe, what is the most unique piece of art that you have ever seen or heard? Uh, most unique? See previous comment about that eyesore that we covered <laughs> up in the church building. <laughs> All right. Um, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the things I, I have to I have to make make note of um, there's a set of steps in in Florence mm -hmm. that was brought from the from the Middle East that were steps that um, Jesus climbed and this while, while it's not specifically art the way that they have it presented is one that shows respect for what it is and you can um, walk up them yourself. And so getting a chance to um, connect with history in that way is, was, it was pretty special for me. Hmm. I'm gonna try and squeeze one more in seventh rule. We'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, if your favorite Bible passage were a painting, what do you think it would look like? Oh, if it were if it were a painting, my favorite Bible verse would probably be a, a picture of of tranquility, um, because my favorite Bible verse is Isaiah 26, three. Mm. And so it would be a a picture of tranquility while depicting um, relationship with God. So likely the easiest way to picture that would be something having to do with man and Jesus, I would mm -hmm. think. 
Um, but yeah, it would be that picture trying to convey the image of peace. Hmm. Nice. I like it. It's cool. I like it. Yeah. So that will conclude the artist corner this go round. And now we'll get into today's more specific questions. Um, before going forward, I wanted to ask Taylor about, uh, your history with the church, what all jobs you've done and, um, what do you do now? Cause I know you've, you've done some stuff with worship and, um, what you do now is like online ish, but I'm not sure. Exactly. It is. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's not that interesting, uh, for people who aren't me. So I started off just serving in church. I, I pretty much grew up in the church. Um, my parents found out they were going to have me and they decided to, uh, start changing their lifestyle. And so all of my life, they've been in church and I've, I've grown up in the church. And so I remember running slides for our kids ministry. And, um, I remember doing puppet ministry. You guys like mm-hmm. creepy puppet things. <laughs> Super Perfect, fun. Yeah. I was, but dude, as a child, I was buying books. I'm such a nerd. I was buying books on <laughs> puppet ministry just to, to grow my it. skill with that. <laughs> so I did that for a while. And then art. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so you did that for a while, then got into the worship scene um, in middle school and high school because um, I was big into classic rock and I had to learn how to play guitar and then got onto worship teams. And actually that one stuck for a while. So in 20, was it 2013, um, got married and in the same month actually started working at the church that I work at now as a part-time youth ministry worship leader. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty cool. Um, you know, drank a lot of monster energy drinks, jumped wow. around on stage. We were filling the room with smoke and it was just a party. Every worship set, basically it was wild. Um, cause you can get away with that kind of stuff with students and adults aren't there, so they don't care. Um, and we had a great time with that. Um, I saw God do some really cool things, um, and grow me in a really big way, ministering to students. Um, it really gives you a good gauge of what the enemy is, uh, really after. And I think that that's the next generation. He's just really attacking, um, minds. And you see that in middle school and high schoolers as they struggle through everything. And so I got a good first row seat about that, um, during that season. And that led into a couple of years later, um, planting, helping to plant one of, uh, one of our campuses at our church were multi-site. And so led worship at that campus for a while. And then, that led into me being the associate pastor at that campus, stepping away from worship and overseeing more of like the social media aspect, um, uh, marketing as a whole, communicating from that campus. And then about a, two years ago now, made the shift to our, what we call the central team, which is basically a resource team for our church. Uh, we've got nine locations. And so the central team uh, basically think of a department head. So I'm like the communications department head. So um, overseeing, you know, marketing, branding, um, social media for everybody, signage, um, graphics, videos, all that kind of fun stuff. And so yeah. that's been super fun. So yeah, man, I've seen some things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man. The video is the one thing that I just can't seem to figure out. <laughs> I'm like, how? people who edit video hats off so much respect. Time, so much it. time. Oh, yeah, that's my my wife is the video editor out of the two of us. And I'm like, I don't understand what voodoo magic that you do, <laughs> but I haven't gotten a grip on it. Uh, I got to I got to comment real quick. There's there's times that that pop up as you as you do ministry where you come across somebody and you're like somebody who speaks my language Um <laughs> Some people, some people think oh, it's a giant curse word to say things like marketing and branding when talking sure. about a church and talking about Christianity. Um, I get you, brother. Uh, it, it's it's an, it's a fascinating intersection of thought processes and approach and all of that kind of stuff, and it really gives a different look at the church experience as a whole. Oh yeah, absolutely. I am. Um, I'm about to ask Joe the same question as far as like background stuff, but I want to jump in this part of the conversation briefly to just kind of say, I think we might end up doing a series on whole church one day of like behind the scenes of the church. Cause there's so much stuff like, like the branded stuff that's like people just are unaware of. Cause it's, it's almost like we present things. I'm trying to word this carefully. 
there's no such thing as too much spirit, but it's almost like we present things too spiritually. Like, oh, God led me to make this graphic. Out. No, you, no, he didn't. You, you saw know that, that on your four years draw age. people's attention. Yeah, like, like, come on, man. Or uh, how much <laughs> of like people getting into ministry really isn't some holy moment where God ascended down and then told the pastor to select you. It's like actually, yeah. there's a lot of mentoring and preparing and work. That's a conversation. And you got to reach out. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, a con- that is yeah. a conversation that needs to yeah. be had. So, everybody listening, hang in there. We're going to do a behind the scenes series eventually. <laughs> but <laughs> for now, Joe, same question. You do a lot of podcasting, like Christian podcasts. Yeah. You do a lot of with your church now. You do some online media stuff. I am. It's funny. I feel like I know the podcast lingo, and then it gets to like other computer stuff, and I'm like, y'all do things that interwebs. <laughs> Church. You go <laughs> you go click click and thing happened on screen. Um yeah. So oh, uh so actually um r- riffing a little bit off of what you had just brought up about um kind of the the actual picture of somebody getting into ministry, um got saved, fell into the prosperity gospel for a second had somebody come alongside me, pull the thread that fell to pieces and it asked, and it left me asking the question, well, what's the point? Um, through people in situation and circumstance, I ended up doing a podcast and, and started doing buddy walk with Jesus, um, with, uh, with a, 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 another guy that, um, was walking, walking alongside me at the time. Um, and so I had this opportunity to, um, uh, I, I joke that I am, I am the child actor of the Christian podcasting world because I grew up in the faith in front of the camera and, in a lot of regards over the last five years. And that we, part of the way through, there was a shift when the world shut down and all of that, our numbers in India started exploding. Interesting. And, yeah. And we, I started reaching out to them like, okay. So you guys are listening. How can we help? What can we do? All of that kind of stuff. And that started to establish a uh, a network of ministry and different things going on and all of that. That still is um, a huge part of what, what Buddy Walk does even today, even though a lot of aspects of the media ministry have changed. It's just me. We do an entire, like it's, it's entirely different now in a lot of regards. Um, kind of a reflection of how I've grown in, in the faith and all of that kind of stuff. Um, another aspect of 2020 was um, falling backwards into creating the house church and um our our church shut down there was a group of us that kind of banded together and because i was one of the loudest voices in the room folks just kind of looking at me as one of the leaders and so um i 110 percent fell backwards into ministry this wasn't some kind of lifelong god ordained process this and that that um, I, I led the house church for several years in this. And as Josh said, it wasn't until like the last year that um, a, a gentleman that I've been doing ministry with for the last couple of years and I, who works with an ordination process, um, decided to put pen to paper and, and start the actual formal ordination process. I was doing the gig of shepherding, pastoring, all of that before becoming ordained, it just was a matter of formalizing it, going through all of that kind of stuff. And so um, we've started building out and taking what we did here as far as the house church goes and have employing that, have been employing that in pockets of the U.S. as well and doing church planning uh, networks and all of that kind of stuff. Um, fast forward to the uh the church that i am doing my residency with um i had started hanging out with a couple of guys after moving back to pennsylvania um that we had floated in similar circles along the uh, along the way and um they had planted a church about 12 years ago and we were having a conversation and i was like you know what are you guys doing 
from a digital standpoint, because we live in a time, like it or not, and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about it, yeah. that there is a digital aspect to ministry that is unprecedented now because of everything that's happened over the last couple of years. It existed prior to 2020, but it really normalized this idea of digital ministry. So what are you guys doing about it? And we had some conversations about it. And a lot of what they were looking for was somebody to come in who had an experience, who had experience in building out a digital ministry and, you know, helping them to open their doors to a whole new aspect of community and all of that kind of stuff. And so um, I've come in and have been u- utilizing my experience to help them establish and will and am doing this residency throughout the end of um, 2023. And uh, we'll we'll see post post that. But um, along the way, I have started other shows and have have had other um, projects and, and we have a whole uh, podcast network and all of that kind of stuff. But have I do a couple of things that are off ministry, but a lot of what I do in front of the in front of the mic nowadays is ministry related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he has a Ninja Turtle show on YouTube, just by the mm-hmm. way. If you like Ninja Turtles, check that out. No, I um, it, it's funny. I know this isn't always the case, but we, we've talked about it before. Um, so Joe's network is the Happy Day Ministries, I, I believe, is the name of your network. Mm-hmm. Podcast network. Yeah. So then we have the Anazal Ministries podcast network. Um, I, I feel like typically our network tends to be a little bit more conceptual and Joe's stuff tends to be a little bit more on the ground, practical kind of stuff. Um, not always. You know, sometimes we we do practical stuff and sometimes conceptual stuff. But, you know, we are friendly networks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good way to word it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of synergy. So I, I'm, one thing I did want to hear from just both of y'all's experiences, you know, in the church and everything you've done. I don't care who answers first. Let's see. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it to Taylor first. Um, how have you seen either the lack of presence of art or the presence of art uh, kind of take away or add to a church service because i know you mentioned earlier like the lights and the smoke and all that stuff and all that stuff is like art in its own way do you think it, how does it add how does it take away what do you what do you think yeah absolutely i i am one of those in the camp of defending all of the um amazing technical artists that create and craft lighting experiences as a form of art i do consider that to be art in the same way that anytime you know somebody picks up a tablet or you know photoshop or illustrator you know anything in the adobe suite that is also creating art it's all yeah it's all art in its own respect and i think i have seen i've been privileged to be able to see large scale events that have really felt immersive um, because of the simple way that the designer of the lights will uh, create a fanning effect. Um, one of, I can't take credit for this image, but um, one of our previous worship pastors pointed this out, that the lights would like do this number. And he would craft that intentionally because it was mimicking somebody raising their hands and surrender. Mm-hmm. And it would be like the entire room would just be like the room itself. It was so crazy. I love these moments, but like the whole room is responding to the presence of God. And it's just like, you, you explain this to like a rando person <laughs> and they're like, yeah, the lights do this. And it's the room. It's the house of God responding to the presence of Jesus. And they're just like, what are you talking about? But the people <laughs> that get it, get it. Um, but I, I certainly have been exposed to, to, to moments like that, where things like that have just added to uh, the experience. And I've also been um, recently preaching in a space where that same thing, uh, that same experience took away, that same lighting element, um, because a DMX cable gets unplugged and lights just start yep. going schizo. They just go crazy. And you're you're trying to like keep people's attention and your own attention. And you're just like... Hmm. Okay, I kind of feel like we're not getting anywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> let's all pray and go home. Yeah. 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 I, so, so again, to piggyback in, and as another person who um, crafts aspects of the worship experience, um, 
when you look at worship as a whole, it is the the worship leaders, whether they're the person who's leading the band or the person who is helping to craft the environment, you are drawing people into, or at least it, it is it is uh, where you should be, is drawing people not to yourself or to a room or to an aspect, but to a posture of worship to God. That's good. Now, there are parts, there are responses that the brain will have, scientifically speaking, to certain stimuli. There is not a thing wrong in the world with utilizing tools Mm -hmm. to serve that purpose of enacting that stimuli like he's talking about of that fanning effect with the lights it's just the same as a distortion effect on a guitar or uh, an effect on an electric keyboard or something along those lines that helps mm-hmm. to create this experience. Yeah, we can rib on it. Yeah, we can make jokes about it in all of the ways that it's used to incredibly cheesy effects and all of that kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that these tools absolutely can be used incredibly effectively to posture people in their heart, in their spirit, in their inner person to engage with God in a very real way. Yeah, I I think this is actually just true of all art, and I am not an art expert, so please feel free to ignore me, listeners. But I, I think really when it gets distracting is when there's too much, not when, you know, not that lighting is a bad thing, but, you know, when you have like red, green laser shooting all over the place, yeah, okay, then it might be distracting, right? Um, same thing's true with your sound. If you have like 25 different kinds of instruments up there, it's going to be distracting. Yeah. Um I think what's interesting, though, is like I personally, I like some of the older feel like I like to go to a church that feels old. The music sounds a little slower. We have the hymns. But here's the thing. They're not not using lighting. They have lighting in there that makes it feel that way. You know, they have instruments to make it sound old. So, you know, the the criticism, what's interesting, a lot of people who will criticize the lights and the smoke machine, all that. It's like, well, the church you go to still uses a lot of these things. They just use it differently. Yeah. And it's like, that's not not using it. <laughs> right. Art art is a tool that that can be used to several different ends. And where it becomes a problem is if it's used to create a show rather than bring people to a place of worship. Right. Mm-hmm. And that can be true of... Um, I so before before getting involved with the church that I'm doing my residency and my wife and I in our ministry um there were there were long stretches of time where we weren't really in church buildings and so we whenever we would have the opportunity to um be in and see beautiful architecture we would we would take that opportunity and we were in um a small town a couple a couple uh a couple hours north of where we where we live and we were in this church and everything was gorgeous like the art was gorgeous but you could listen to the people talk about it and see where their heart was hmm. you could see where you could see the fact that their heart was more on the mm-hmm. image that it created rather than the space that they had to worship God or the community mm-hmm. that they had to worship God. Yeah. And that just like when you're trying to just throw everything at the wall to create a rock concert environment and we've just got to add more and more and more, mm-hmm. those are all things that are not – actually being used to put the emphasis on God. And that's where the wheels fall off. Mm. Yeah, man. So I don't think this will be too hard to transition, but the the main reason we have you both here is you're both doing online things. And I think right now we still do, the church is still wrestling with some of these questions of like lighting, smoke machines, you know, do we have icons? Do we not have icons? 
Um, I would say by no means is that stuff settled, but I think the biggest ground that we're working on with this kind of stuff is more of our online media. You know, how much is on the website? Is it okay to have our sermons online or is that taking away from the experience? Because some people will only watch online. You know, we're afraid that some people are only online church people now. And, um, you know, like you, you mentioned earlier, you know, branding, marketing sounds like bad words. So you both live in this world. How do you address the questions of like how – how it's okay and how do we brand how do we have an online presence in the church like just how do you do it like what is the mindset here yeah it's a like anything else and what we're saying is it's a fine line and it's a balance it's not necessarily for me a, a very difficult balance but there is the struggle to do too much with it um so just for us our church we aren't on every single existing social media platform just because yeah. though a small percentage of our people will be on all of them, that's so much to just practically manage that it becomes, you just start putting out content that isn't actually valuable to anybody. So it's kind of a waste of everyone's time. Um, so we're, we're choosy and selective with some of that stuff. Um, but for uh, the overarching vision, I guess, for our digital ministry as a whole. And for us, that's a website, that's social media, that's a church app. Um, I think that pretty much encompasses all of them broad, very broadly. The whole idea is not to be a, a resource that, that uh, replaces the Sunday morning experience. So for us, we look at digital ministry as a front door with the end goal always to bring people into the physical gathering. Um, that's our lead pastor's bend. And so we all share that same heart of what we produce and promote online does not replace and doesn't take the place of the Sunday gathering. But for some people who are, you know, too nervous to come into church, it's a wonderful uh, disarming experience for them to be able to experience the message for a couple of weeks and then finally build up the courage to walk through the front doors because it is a difficult thing for some people who have been wounded um, by best intentioned, you know, church folks. And it takes some time for them to build up the courage to, to come through the front doors. And so for us, we see digital ministry as, as a means to um, usher people into the front door. Yeah. So this is one just to be transparent with our listeners and you two that I, I get a little personal with um, my grandfather before he passed away, got to the point where he wasn't able to go to a church anymore. He just physically was not able to. So he was, you know, listening to sermons online. He was doing that. He was listening to, you know, music, the radio, you know, and having his own worship time. So I, I do get a little offended is not the right word, but I get a little defensive when people are like, oh, that's not really worship or that can't be church. That does not really church. He's just listening to a sermon as I'm like, hold up. Listen, I agree. A person gathering is important, but you cannot convince me. My grandfather was not doing church that last couple of years, you know? So that's where, right. that's just where I'm coming from. Just to be transparent to everybody. Um, Joe, same question. Like, as far as like, how do you address these questions of like branding as opposed to, you know, why not just let the spirit draw them in all that? You know, I, I feel like we have a lot of these kind of conversations when people are confused about how we use online media. So one of the things that I think um, can be um, a challenge for folks is this idea of people utilizing skills to serve the kingdom of God. Now that might seem like a like a non-starter, but if we take it out of the realm of every single thing is God ordained and every single thing is this lofty experience, and this is just people that were born that have skill sets and they choose to use those skill sets for God, that that suddenly takes this takes some of the sovereignty out of it and some of the spiritualism out of it. Now, I say that in an effort to demonstrate the fact that when you're talking about things like branding and marketing or doing something with lights and crafting an experience or whatever, it is as simple as utilizing skills to bring people into the door. And and then the hope is that they are 
that that they are met with a welcoming environment, an actual community, and they're able to um, engage with God and all, all of those things that that then, yes, there are absolutely spirit led aspects of this. It's not just man, but bringing people to an environment or into a posture where that is possible is absolutely um, something that it's just it's it's part of how mm-hmm. we can engage in and serve the larger the larger grouping. Now, part of where and I and I have got I've got to give it to this conversation. Generally, when I'm on these ty- the, these types of conversations with the whole church or with other Christians, it takes a lot longer than forty minutes for me to find a spot where I've got to say I disagree a little bit. Um, but but I, I so so I'm going to disagree first, but then but then it's going to sound like I'm doubling back. So hear me out. I don't think the end goal should always be getting people in the door because that is a losing prospect because there will always be people who do not want to come into the door. There will always be a group of people that their goal, their goal is never to come in the door. And if the bending is to come in the door, they're done. They they don't they because they know that they're trying to be wooed into the door. I say all of that with uh, coming from my context and coming from my experience base. I say all of that to say, you know what? If in I don't know Trenton, New Jersey, I'm just throwing out towns. If if in Trenton, New Jersey, you've got a church and they've got and they've got an online program that has a digital component, and they're looking at the groups of you know Elizabethtown or into Philly or into like the, the surrounding areas where yes, there is a digital outreach portion of it, but this idea of hey, we also have this community here, and that's their servant, whatevs. Awesome. Go in peace. I have no problems. Like that's that that is a type of ministry that I used to say, oh, people who do that have the wrong beat. It's just a different beat. That's all. I but I I do I do think there is a necessity for an aspect of digital ministry that holds people to no expectation. Because when you hold people to no expectation of coming into your door, then that leaves opportunity to help them cultivate the skill set to open up doors where they're at. Not, not necessarily plan to church, but, but understand that it is possible for them to engage with your community and they are still part of your community and they are still part of your family and there is no distinction between somebody who is a part of your family who engages online or somebody who is a part of your family that walks to the door and and that but but giving per, giving a person the skill set to be able to if they don't walk into your door they can have a community and all of that kind of stuff it's like any aspect of this we've been talking about different aspects where okay so is the light show part of the worship experience or is the show an idol that you feel like you need to be cool enough in order for this to for for this mm-hmm. to be a good enough worship experience or whatever like that is people coming through your door and this this part of it man is not a this is not directed toward towards you I don't want you to think that I'm like commenting on what you said I'm saying this as a general statement to anybody who holds that line of the only real version of church is when people come in come in through the door and all of that kind of stuff is are are you are you holding that level of community as a standard in which man we really want to see people be able to have a have a community even if it's not our community we really want to see people have a community or are you idolizing your church building as the preeminent form of worship and that's where you have to start to ask those uncomfortable questions if you are a person like josh was talking about that is like oh this isn't a real form of worship or this should only be a a, a stepping stone or whatever like that you know what i mean so absolutely i'm gonna throw it back to taylor but I, i'm kind of thinking I'm going to show behind the scenes of podcasting and, and, and show some cards for everybody too. Um, 
for podcasting, if you're setting up like your market and how you're bringing people in, you're not doing like a Facebook post of here's where you can support us and here's where you can do this. Here's where you can do that. You're kind of funneling people through, right? So you're going to start with, hey, come see our website. And that website is going to have your podcast. And that's where you might mention where they can support you. And you're kind of funneling. So your big grab you're always targeting something, right? You have a target with it. Now, that's not to say if all someone does is see your website and leave that you're like, oh, that's a failure. It's just that you do have a purpose of where you're trying to lead people online. It's just just like a McDonald's has signs, you know, the stuff that they're trying to lead you to the restaurant. If you pay attention right now, they're trying really hard to lead you to want to order online so that they don't have to pay people to work inside. <laughs> and that's just how the business works. And that's like the podcast thing. We do we do a lot of the same things. Um, so with, with the church, what's interesting is the win is if they're in discipleship, they're in relationship, but they're with Jesus. And, and I think Taylor's going to agree with all of this, but I'll let him tell me if I'm stupid or not later. But I'm thinking a lot of churches mindset is more where the website is to funnel people in. And that's where we're going to funnel them into these discipleship groups and stuff like that. I don't think that's necessarily wrong. I, I like it. Uh, the problem I have usually is if I talk to a pastor and the first thing out of, when I ask them how their church is doing, the first thing they say is, oh, great, we have 300 people a week. <laughs> then I'm like, is it really great? Because that's if that's all you could tell me, I don't know if those 300 people are getting discipled because it sounds like you're just concerned with them being there. <laughs> you know, nickels and noses, man. It's all about nickels. <laughs> it's all about nose. No, I, I completely agree. I was actually going to make a joke about that. Um oh. It is especially, so I mean, full disclosure, if it hasn't come out with the multi-site comment, I do work at a multi-site mega church. Um, we're in nine different cities across the low country of South Carolina. And the, the temptation is for people to see that and go, they're all about money. They're all about attendance. That's the only thing they care about. And I am privileged to serve under a lead pastor that has been here for over 30 six years, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, and right. through that entire time, he has led with zero moral failures. Um, he is aggressively tackling debt to where we just did a massive multi-million dollar renovation on on our one of our campuses. And we only had to borrow $500,000 through the whole process. I mean, he's a financial, um, some would say cheapskate, but he's a guru with the whole thing. Um, and so for me, this whole conversation, Josh, you said that if somebody visits the website and then doesn't do anything, that it's not a failure. I'm going to say I would consider if somebody goes to our church website or if somebody attends our church online experience and just leaves, that is a failure to me. I think that unless someone is able to, whether they attend the church in person or whether they attend and, and engage and interact digitally, if they are not prompted and then take a, a next step of some kind, I don't know that we really did what we set out to do because I don't lay my head down at night on Sunday nights and go, man, we put on a killer church service, mission accomplished. We had everything. Yeah. It was amazing. I lay my head down at night and I can only rest when I feel like we have done the gospel justice. We've told the full gospel. And when we have helped people identify what their next step in their discipleship process is. So uh, we always say as a church, we exist. Um, we, we try to stay away from those cliche statements because again, mega churches have mega bullet <laughs> uh, targets and stuff. Um, yeah. But we, we always say that we exist to develop fully devoted followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so all of the ministries that we offer, all the programs, everything tries to funnel right through that. So, and I would, I'm, again, I'm going to argue that no matter how long you've been in the faith, if you've been saved for nine days or 90 years, you have a next step. So it's up to us to help steward that time we have together to help you take that next step. So I don't, it, it looks different for everybody. Maybe it's, you know, picking up the Bible and reading it every day. Maybe it's praying every day. Maybe it's tithing for the first time. Maybe it's joining a small group. Maybe it's telling your testimony to somebody. All so, of those are examples of next steps that I think you should take. So let me ask you this then. So the way your website and stuff is is set up, you're you're funneling them to church, funneling to disciple group. What if they saw your website and they saw like some random, you know, tagline or something that you used, you know, branding, and all they took out of that tagline was the message and said, I need to go to a church here. And they live five states away and went to their local church. To you, is that a failure? Because they didn't go through the funnel to your church. 
but something you said still enabled them to go seek out fellowship. I don't believe there are very many people on our staff at all that would call that a failure. Okay. Yeah, I that, that's what I was figuring. That big K kingdom mentality, and that is mm. crucial. You have to keep that. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a lot easier. I say unfortunately. If fortunately for me, it's a lot easier to be a podcast in, the, in this scenario than a church. Because obviously, if you're a local church, you're, you're going to funnel them to your church. Otherwise, that's just stupid marketing. <laughs> Whereas podcasts, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm just funneling you somewhere you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's so as as the person in the room that um in yesteryear um i i would have been one of those guys like what the second that you that you had mentioned what your role within the church was and i i was like oh okay so i'm talking to a mega church guy all right um i i would i would have i would have giddied up and been like all right this is going to, I'm going to have some fun at this guy's expense. Um, you still should, <laughs> but, but I've, but I've realized along the way, um, you know, and, and unfortunately a lot, a lot of this has come mm-hmm. through scars and doing this wrong and mm-hmm. getting this wrong and all of that kind of stuff that um, there are absolutely more, there's more than one way to do this thing. I wish you would talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's, because there's different demographics and different areas and different, different aspects of the worship environment that lead people in to that. Some people are more, more comfortable authentically doesn't have to be uh, inauthentic. People automatically associate mega church inauthentic. I know because I did it for years. Yep. But but there are some aspects of that 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 is genuinely more comfortable for somebody to woo them into the worship experience. Mm-hmm. So just because they've got more money or just because they've got more space or just because they've got more locations or whatever means that they're automatically by default not serving not serving people authentically. No, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I think that there are examples but just the same for everybody that I work with that engages more comfortably mm-hmm. in the small church environment, there are tons of examples right around me. I can point to some <laughs> that are sub a hundred people that have an American flag in the pulpit that have a, a, a political sign in the, uh, so I'm in the East. That's a big thing that from w- with where I'm at is the nationalism part of the conversation, but, mm-hmm. but enter thing that is not the gospel here. Mm-hmm. The amount of people, the amount of money, the amount of politics, the amount of this or that or the other thing doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a dynamic goalpost regardless of what angle you're entering into so good. the the conversation and mm-hmm. so what if they've if they've there's been a series of events that has led to a grouping of people being able to serve more people in more spots okay so you said you've got nine campuses right are all yeah. nine of those campuses Bought in, sold out to serving the communities that that they're in, demonstrating the go- uh, the gospel of of the kingdom of God, and being able to serve uh, to serve people. Is that the mission statement of each one of those nine places? Then, if it is, I don't care whether or not they're nine individual churches or nine that are under the same umbrella. You're still doing the thesis statement, right? Yeah, I uh, just to be, man, I'm, I'm doing a lot of transparent stuff this episode. If I had not known Taylor and Pink, I probably still have some of this like biases against mega churches in mind. Like I actually think I was challenged a lot by like realizing the church that you were working at. Because you know, when I met you, you guys were at like Kogop, which you know is mostly small churches. And I was oh, like, okay, yeah. yeah. He's one of these good small Pentecostal <laughs> church guys. And then he went to this and I'm like, 
Wait a minute. One of those <laughs> nice guys that does a small church actually knows Christianity. Yeah. Oh, man. No, but it, it's just funny kind of just having that challenge and realizing. And, of course, the whole church plug being, of course, there's those of us who prefer, you know, older, small buildings that sing hymns. And then those who yeah. are the big mega churches with the fast songs. And then those who do house church and maybe a lot of people who are scarred from church and don't want to go to the buildings. You know, we have the people who grew up listening to Lincoln Park and people who grew up listening to Casting Crowns. And what's beautiful about the church is it can hold all of those together in one body. And it's yeah. beautiful. It's all um, the kingdom. Yeah. Can I, can I, sh- can I shout out another member of your, of your network? Um, yes. That was the big catalyst for me that, that helped reorient how, how I conceived. And, and part of this in full transparency came as a, um, a beauty from ashes sort of, sort of situation, because anybody that was privy to some of those behind the scenes conversations know that sometimes it, it got, it got rough behind the scenes and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. And it's pastor Will, Will Rose was, um, is a guy that really, mm-hmm. um, was patient with me in my nonsense um took a lot of stiff shots to the jaw at my at, at from me um and just kept, just kept coming forward in love and while his church isn't necessarily like a mega church in the strictest sense or anything else like that it's more of the exposure to somebody who does church differently than i do that help open up my eyes to say hey look there's there, there is room in this conversation for all of us. Yeah, yes, there is a part of this that I got jaded because a lot of the people that were coming across my doorstep that I was in charge of caring for their souls were people that were damaged by things like the megachurch environment and all of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And so it became easy to create a straw man and attack the straw man. Yeah. But the reality is a lot of these small interdenomination here churches mm-hmm. are just as capable of destroying lives. They just may do so, I don't know, on a smaller scale. Yeah. I I mean hopefully I'll remember. I'm gonna drop we had a round table discussion on the show about church hurt. And um I think that was a really powerful conversation. Kind of address some of those two of um what causes this and how do we address it? And yeah. Yeah, it's not just big churches, it turns out. I, I didn't want to leave this conversation. So we all three have podcasts right now. Do a little bit meta thing here. And I love that earlier Taylor mentioned that, yeah, any, anything using Adobe, <laughs> the Adobe Suites is art. And I'm like, great. Uh, podcast, we use all kinds of stuff in the Adobe Suites, right? Right. Like uh, I'm thinking of like, how much work it is to build a logo, how much work it is to, you know, have these websites, what yep. social media things you want to do, how you channel people in, what's your trailer going to sound like, your theme music. There's all kinds of artistic decisions in creating podcast and branding. And there is this side of, yeah, these are Christian podcasts. So I can't do, you know, if I go listen to some of the biggest podcast experts out there, they're gonna be like, yeah, the best way to do be controversial, say something, hate is just (laughs) as good as, you know, love and, you know, getting someone to attack you is good publicity. And I'm like, that's all true. But, uh, this is a church unity podcast. I feel like creating controversy kind of goes against the mission statement. Wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> so how how do we how do we balance this like branding, spiritual, like what is podcast even? Because you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you do is a Christian podcast. That's not church. And I'm like, yeah, we're not holding church services. But um right here I have three believers and we're having some conversations challenging each other and building one another up. And I'm like, that's um in my Bible, that's church. I don't know. How do, how do we how do we juggle this? You know, I think being willing to ask yourself what the what the motivation is when it comes to um what you create, you know, are are you doing it from a perspective of I'm just trying to throw stuff out there in an effort to get more downloads in order to promote myself or am I ultimately pointing people to Jesus. Um, and, and if somebody is listening to the production value of a podcast and as somebody who the people that listen to buddy Wap, many of them look to me as a pastor, I 
if, if anybody listens to that and is like, well, that's, that's not, that's not church. That's not real. That's not take a, take a look at the production value that goes into your church, regardless of its size. Because even if you've got several hundred people in your small hole in the wall church, there's still production value that goes into it. That's there right. are still people that if you've got musicians, people who have learned to hone their craft, the mm -hmm. time that is spent on those on those uh, those instruments, if for the for the the places, you know, making sure that everything is clean, making sure that every, you know what I mean. Like, mm -hmm. there's still effort that goes into it, regardless of whether or not it's in the digital space or if it's brick and mortar. You know what I mean. And I mm -hmm. would argue the the question of you know i had said being self aware and asking yourself the hard questions from the content creator side or from the 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 church staff member side but also from the critic side mm -hmm. if you are coming to this and having critiques and all of that kind of stuff ask yourself why what what what's your what's your reasoning what's your what's your motivation mm -hmm. behind yeah. having these critiques what are you looking to accomplish and start to ask yourself those probing questions to figure out where you're at and and what the intent is behind what you're doing yeah i'm um i'm gonna throw this to taylor but so, <laughs> you triggered a few thoughts for me too especially just in creating, um, so first I'm going to do some backstory. A long time ago, I had a pastor tell me, because um, we were just talking about worship, just the idea of what worship is. He said he went to a church before that everybody, you know, we had worship in the beginning of service and we had some really powerful moments. And this is, um, and he said, and then, you know, you see the guy outside and he's cleaning the toilet and it's like, oh yeah, that guy, he missed church. He was cleaning. You don't think of that as worship. And he's like, but you know what I learned was that worship leader, we found out was actually cheating on his wife. He was actually, you know, out drinking the very, that same Sunday night. And that guy who was just cleaning the toilets, he works overtime at the church cleaning and doesn't get paid. He had already retired. He is having medical issues and refuses to stop trying to clean. He's like, let me yeah. tell you, that guy was the one worshiping that dude on the stage. He was allowing other people were able to worship. He wasn't even right with God. And I'm like, yeah, man, that's and, it, and it's true. And it's it's actually helped me a lot with like a lot of musical groups where like their songs I connect with and I worship to and you find out bad things about them. I'm like, OK, wait a minute. I'm still able to worship to this. <laughs> they might not have been worshiping when they created it, but God can use all things. And then remembering, yeah, um, that guy cleaning the toilet was the guy really worshiping. And then thinking about this podcast thing. And I'm like, yeah, hey, maybe I'm not leading service anywhere. But I'm able to put a lot of hours into working on this, making it sound good, creating something that helps people. I'm sorry. I'm almost done. I promise, Taylor. And, and a few years ago, even, because I tried to just leave this bare bones conversation because I'm like, that's really what it's about. And we did a series. I forget what the series was right now. Actually, I think it was the Church Offices series. And Joe was part of that as well. And we did some of this like um, – we have, you know, these kind of like ambiance music that we started doing. And I did it in between to show that there was a transition of one person we were talking to and the next one. So you kind of hear this, like, see if I can get this a little bit louder. Yeah, you, you, you hear this, like, music mm -hmm. in between. And I was like, okay, yeah, that kind of sounds cool. But I didn't want to do it while people were talking. I was like, I don't want to feel like I'm manipulating people. I just want to trigger, hey, this is a new thing. And then Joe someone would say that's me. perfectly acceptable. How <laughs> <laughs> we're well, wired, nothing wrong with it. And that's what someone told me, though, was... They heard that and it drew them back into the show because sometimes you're listening and you just kind of have something on in the background. It's like, actually, it allowed me to focus a little bit more and hear more. And as someone yeah. with ADHD, someone saying they're able to focus better is always like a key to me. Like, hmm, am I able to do this? And we started doing this with the verse in the beginning. People are like, you know, I actually felt more out of that verse. I'm like, I don't think I'm being manipulative just because I'm allowing the music to draw people's attention to certain parts of the show. And um, those kind of decisions are the kind of things I'm thinking of where it's like there is a line. I could be manipulative. I could play really sad m music and talk about how poor I am. And if you want to donate to the whole church body, <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm talking about. So but there is a line there like you, there is manipulating. But then there is this using something to allow people's focus to go a certain place. Um, yeah. Taylor, as a new podcaster, what are your thoughts on some of this stuff? I think everything that you have both said has been yay and amen from this corner. Um, <laughs> the difference in you've got ministry and you've got manipulation 
we're mm-hmm. always trying to figure out how to tote that line. And I think that the difference maker is your motivation. So you have to, just like Joe was saying, you have to go back to your why. You have to go, okay, why am I doing this? And I, I would say further with that, when you get frustrated with some of these things and you're not maybe hitting metrics that you set for yourself, metrics goals or things like that, and you evaluate your whys, I think that's a that's a good place to be because you kind of just have – I'm, our podcast is very new. We just started back in July. Um, and just to be candid, it, we weren't setting out to establish a ministry. We weren't setting out to establish a brand, a following. Um, we messed around as a couple, my wife and I, with a YouTube channel way back in the day. But video, again, to bring it back full circle, that's a <laughs> lot of editing time. And I just really is. don't want to put that effort in, to be honest. But we, we landed on podcasting because for us, it, it's a way to process the journey that we're, we're on with the Lord. And obviously, I'm an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God, and so I'm in the ministry world. So we, we talk about ministry stuff most of the time, but sometimes we'll hit on some of the stuff, and we just want to process verbally stuff that's just happening in our lives or difficult situations that we've gone on. So we're not even now... We don't have a great logo. I, I wouldn't say it's just a <laughs> font that I chose and just threw a little cover it, it art thing good. together. I like it. Um, yeah, the but two we're not trying to put on there. There's there's some pretty people. <laughs> they are they're pretty nice. Yeah, it's our our only host right now, so it's it's good stuff. <laughs> um, but it, for us, it's not. We're not trying to build anything really. We're just trying to. Um, we want a place to process and. We've always found by leading small groups throughout the years that when we are vulnerable and transparent. Mm -hmm. then other people receive from that. And so for us, it's a great way to just be honest Mm -hmm. and to kind of heal through difficult things, but also to encourage people along the way. Yeah. So now you're getting like touchy grounds. Joe and I have had plenty of discussions of how much of a podcast is for us and how much of it is for those listening. (laughs) And, um, I, I, you know, I, I think when we first met, I think I was always on the, this is for us side usually. And, and I think slowly throughout the years, sometimes it's almost flipped where Joe's like, wait, sometimes, you know, you are doing it for yourself. <laughs> like, right. OK, but, you know, I'm a hard convert to some of Joe's ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, Josh. Josh and I. So for those of you that don't know, we were together hand in hand for a, the better part of a year, if not a little over a year over on SG. And um, we have. We have influenced each other a lot when it comes to um, the way we conceive of community and artistic projects and all all of those kinds of things. And, you know, being being in the media world and starting my media journey before the Christian journey, I I can tell you that, yeah, sometimes if what you're looking for is to pop a rating like. Josh said, I've got a, uh, I've got a, a TMNT channel it has nothing to do with ministry. I'm 100% trying to pop a rating. So mm. I do the things that you do to pop a rating it is it's fine. You know what I mean? But when you start to talk about slice of life or ministry or different things like that, that tends to become a different part of the conversation that marries more of those worlds of sometimes part of opening up the mic and talking is almost like an audio journal of sorts Mm -hmm. that absolutely if Mm -hmm. you come to and you find benefit in and you can engage with and direct you Mm -hmm. to god and all of that kind of stuff aces awesome great Mm -hmm. but ultimately even if three people have that experience there's still benefit that you're drawing from it of having that audio journal of sorts in that place to be able to process out loud. Oh yeah. Or even Definitely. like you were saying to see the progression, like in your, the buddy walk references that you were making early in the episode, you almost get to look back now because that was from what I understand the mm-hmm. early days of your faith. Yep. Now you almost get like a, a, an audible scrapbook, right. Of yeah. theology that you are constantly like we all are doing growing in and you get to see where the Lord has brought you through the process. That's yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Joe and I get to listen to um, us talk about uh, Toby Maguire, Spider-Man, and then Fox and the Hound, <laughs> and then slowly <laughs> progress. 
that's that's some inside jokes for everybody but you know it's yep. fine but on a more serious note speaking of like systematic ecology on this conversation and um i'll leave it with this and then we'll move on to the god moment and wrap up but uh recently on systematic ecology we're, we do halloween stuff and um brandon knight you know he does uh, my seminary life another show for our network good friend of me and joe's um I don't know if Taylor's met Brandon or not. You should. Um, mm. You'd like him. But <laughs> we were doing an episode. We do like a Halloween drive-in where we just kind of watch a movie and talk about it. And we were talking about um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman of all things. And near the end, there's this point, And it's really funny because you could actually hear where we're talking to the audience and suddenly the pronouns change and we're talking to each other. And it goes <laughs> from like us talking about like like what it means to kind of like live with this thing in yourself that you can't deny on your own right living like this kind of monster and then becoming this conversation where brandon is consoling me telling me listen josh if you're truly afraid of like having friends in that way and like you think that you're hurting others that's the very reason you need community and it was like just powerful moment and it's i actually kept it all on the episode even because it was so funny because it went from like us talking to the audience to him saying to me and then me going brandon i needed that that's so and it was just like a genuine like yeah and what's funny is, yeah, that that episode kind of became more for me. And yet that's the one that recently I'm hearing a lot of people message me and there's like, hey, actually, I have some of these fears, too. And we're able to have these what I would say pastoring conversations kind of leading what Joe was talking about earlier with his conversation with people about Buddy Walk. And yeah, that's real ministry, right? Like, I don't think anyone who sees the full picture would say that's not real ministry. However, there are plenty of people who look on the outside and go, these Christians are talking about a old monster movie. That's not ministry. And I'm like. Okay, but you, you don't know the lives that were touched. You don't know what that did to me in my heart. And that's where podcasting is this weird realm of art and ministry and geeking out and all kinds of like personal journal. Podcasting is a weird world. <laughs> that true, that man. is that true, truer words, man. Podcasting is a <laughs> weird world. I uh, today has been the day of doing the rounds for your network. This is the third <laughs> interview today that I have done for a show on your <laughs> network. Right. Seriously, seriously. I forgot. But uh, w- we uh, stay stay tuned if you guys listen to SG. Um, be on the lookout for an episode that I'm going to be on for. Um, psycho 2 we're talking about psycho 2 nice and uh there there was a lot of benefit that i got from um being being a being a pastor who has been called to ministering to um the alt lifestyle scenes of like the punk rock worlds and the goth worlds and doing things Mm -hmm. that look a little bit different than your average pastor and all of those kinds of things it can be a lonely beat and so um getting a chance to be able to engage with another christian and we got to some some um Mm-hmm. aspects of the christian conversation you know because that's yeah. that's part of, that's kind of baked into the sg formula and all of that kind of stuff but um it it, it certainly sounds like maybe not to the same <laughs> the same degree as the frankenstein and wolfman conversation um but that was still beneficial for me and still um life-giving to me because it was being able to hang out with another Christian. Um, layers to that comment, because I was on with Christian. <laughs> with Christian. <Heschel. laughs> um, but it, it, and still be able to commune over a shared love of mm-hmm. of a horror movie, you know? Uh, speaking of Christian Ashley, he also has a podcast on the AMP network, uh, Let Nothing Move You. I'm just going to keep plugging things. Um, also, I, for, I forgot to tell, tell Taylor and the Clydes, uh, this month's theme actually is just Joe Day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, man. No, with that, though, we, we are going to jump to our God moment segment. Uh, we just bring something up that uh, we're, we've seen God in the last week. Um, blessing, whatever it may be. Um, challenge, you know, anything like that. Oh man, I've um CJ always makes me go first, but he like talks about me talking too long first and that gives me time to think <laughs> of my thing. Um, <laughs> I've got one pretty easily okay, grabbable okay, if good, you want me good. to go first. Yeah, I, yeah, I need a I need a second. <laughs> so you go. So, um I'm going to I'm going to give a another um semi beauty from ashes moment. Um I was invited to a men's group that um went sideways. I'll just leave it there. Um but because of that, I did 
um, a live stream on on Monday for the church. And in the time between the men's group and the time of the live stream, it reaffirmed this idea of to to quote the great philosopher Kurt Cobain. I would rather you hate me for who I am than love mm-hmm. me for something that I'm not. Um, and for those of you that have never heard that bit before, no, I don't actually <laughs> think they could, it's a bit that I do on every single show that I'm on. Um, but oh, it, it's it reaffirmed like you don't have to get where I'm called. You don't have to get my story for it to be um, valid in the eyes of God. And it is, and it is for some people to get, but not for everybody. And it was just kind of this um, reaffirmation of, even though I might not look and sound like some of my contemporaries, Mm -hmm. that God has me serving um, the people that he has for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, good stuff. I um, you know, this is gonna be kind of like a TJ one. This is more of like a small moment, but I I have a lot going on in my life right now. Uh, you know, I'm working overtime at Chipotle, probably like 50, 60 hours a week. Um, I just started pre law school, and that's a a lot on its own. Um, I do the whole podcast network. You know, I do this podcast, another podcast, another podcast. I edit a few other podcasts. I do the voice for someone else's show. Um. I tend to stay pretty busy. And last weekend, we went to a friend's house to just kind of play board games and stuff. And it was crazy because part of me almost wanted to find an excuse not to go. Um, Partially because I'm just so busy and sometimes you just want to lay down. And partially because Mm -hmm. uh, my football team was playing another ranked team. And I'm like, oh, man, I could stay at home by myself and watch that. (laughs) And yell at the TV. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm not going to stare at my phone the whole time. I checked my phone twice. Um, and this is this is so lame, but I checked it once it was at halftime and we were losing by three and I was in so much anxiety. I was like, I I'm sorry, guys, this game Catan that I played for the first time seems cool, but peace, you know, like, first time you <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not great. Greek geek greds there, but I'm like, you know what? I was like, uh, I put my phone away and I didn't look at it again. And it had been a couple hours. I'm like, I know the game's over. And it's driving me insane. Like, did we have our first loss of the season? Is our season ruined? Am I going to forever hate my life? Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying not to let this thing control me. So eventually I just look. I'm like, you know, I just got I got to know what happened. And we won pretty big. And I was like, man, look, this happened fine. I didn't need to watch the game. Everything's OK. I was able to still get A's on my homework for the week, still make enough overtime that I'm going to afford to go to do our vacation next weekend. And life is fine. I was able to just spend time with friends and everything was okay. And it was just kind of this comforting idea of, hey, you can still socialize. <laughs> it's fine. So that that's kind of my my blessing and challenge wrapped into one. <laughs> Beautiful lesson in sovereignty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this uh, week, uh, last week, I think it was, I started reading a book. Uh, my wife's family has brought us a pretty difficult season throughout the past couple of years. And so I was, I finished up the last book I was reading and I was looking for my, my next one. Um, cause I try to read like 12 books a year, which I know doesn't seem like a lot, but man, after seminary, I just cold stopped reading everything. Cause I was so done with reading one book a week, basically. Um, and so I picked up a book basically on a compilation of several short stories on grief testimonies really, I guess on grief. And so it's a whole book that essentially the Lord through it has been showing me how he is present in different ways and different people in the whole grief process. And I have teared up through just reading this book more than many other books that I've read. And it's so unique, but it's just simple stories of uh, nurses or counselors just having these really vulnerable moments with people in their grief. And it's just beautiful how the Lord is orchestrating that whole thing. And to me, he's, he's just been reminding me that he's right there in the grief. You know, he's right there in the grave, right with you. Man, good stuff. I, sometimes there's conversations that you just don't want to end, but that's the nature of a podcast. <laughs> so guys, 
thank you everybody so much for your time joe and christian and christian joe and taylor i just so used to talk to christian all the time man and um thank you everybody who's listening um please share it with a friend an enemy or a cousin if you have enemies or cousins i suppose hopefully you have at least a friend if not reach out we'll be your friend go to discord you know we'll talk to you there uh, the discord link is in the show notes uh, make sure you check out all of the other anazal ministry podcast shows and the uh, happy day ministries shows as well um you know to support everybody we we love people listening and interacting with us and um being a part of one another's lives through online media and online conversations. Um, it's a good time. So with that, um, next week, we're going to be continuing our series of the last episode. We're going to be talking to Professor Chris Moreland of the Catholic tradition. He's going to discuss the use of statues and other imagery in their church. After that, we're going to have a one week break from one week break from the show. Speaking of breaks and time needed to myself, um, <laughs> then we're going to be back with a roundtable discussion, um, and we're going to be talking about church polity. And of course, finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Whether or not he knows it is a great question. Who knows? <laughs> he might have heard this by now. I don't know. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for listening to the whole church podcast. Again, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast or on captivate.fm or on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a one time tip through Captivate. Thank you for listening.